There, there you go, Dai. Okay, thank you, Peter. I've got it. Good evening, everybody. It's lovely to be with you again. Uh, apologies, I will not be with you in uh, December. I shall be sunning myself on Bondi Beach or some <laughs> beach or other um, with the family. Well, excitement here is immense, especially for my, my, my beloved. She can't wait to get there. But there we are. So um, what I want to do is this. Uh, here at home, we've been looking in these past three or four weeks at some of the Old Testament history, um, actual events in the history of Israel that are taken up by the writers of the New Testament, and they use those historical events in order to, uh, to describe the glory of the gospel, the wonder of the gospel. Um, I'm sure many of you will have, in your reading of the old, will have recognized that the New Testament writers use those events as a platform for presenting the glories of the Lord Jesus. We've looked at things uh, you know, like Abraham, the promises made. We've looked at uh, Sarah and Hagar. We've looked at various others. And tonight, what I'd like to do is to take you way back into the Old Testament to begin with anyway, and into the book of Joshua. Uh, so if you can find uh, Joshua's uh, book chapters three and four. Now, whether we're going to get through chapters three and four, I guess is a bit doubtful, but we're going to have a go anyway. And um, you are aware, I'm sure, that the two chapters have to do with the crossing of the River Jordan, out of death into life. But there are some remarkable statements in both the chapters that are picked up um, in the new um, and are a presentation of what real true baptism is. Um, and uh, if we don't get through it tonight, then maybe come January, we can pick it up and kind of finish the subject. But let me take you into chapter three of the book of Joshua. And I want to read right from the very beginning that Joshua rose early in the morning and he and all the sons of Israel set out from Shittim, came to the Jordan and they lodged there before they crossed. And it came about at the end of three days that the officers went through the midst of the camp and they commanded the people saying, when you see the Ark of the Covenant, the Ark of the Covenant of the Lord your God with the Levitical priests carrying it, then you shall set out from your place and go after it. However, there shall be between you and it a distance of about 2,000 cubits by measure. Do not come near to it, that you may know the way by which you shall go for you have not passed this way before. Then Joshua said to the people, consecrate yourselves. He said to the, uh, the priests, uh, take up the Ark of the Covenant and cross over ahead of the people. So they took up the Ark of the Covenant and went ahead of the people. Now the Lord said to Joshua, this day I will begin to exalt you in the sight of all Israel, that they may know that just as I have been with Moses, I will be with you. 
You shall moreover command the priests who are carrying the Ark of the Covenant saying, when you come to the edge of the waters of the Jordan, you shall stand still in the Jordan. Then Joshua said to the sons of Israel, come here and hear the words of the Lord your God. And Joshua said, by this you shall know that the living God is among you and that he will assuredly dispossess from before you the Canaanite and the Hittite and the Hevite and the Perizzite, the Girgashite, the Amorite and the Jebusite. Behold, the Ark of the Covenant of the Lord of all the earth is crossing over ahead of you into the Jordan. Now then, take for yourselves 12 men from the tribes of Israel, one man for each tribe, and it shall come about when the, the soles of the feet of the priests who carry the ark of the Lord, the Lord of all the earth, shall rest in the waters of the Jordan. The waters of the Jordan shall be cut off, and the waters which are flowing down from above shall stand in one heap. Now let's pause there and just take note of two or three things before we move on. Um, the, the, there's a reference to the Ark of the Covenant. And that, I think, needs a little bit of development. If you would just uh, turn back with me into chapter 25 of the book of Exodus, you'll come across the instructions that God gave to Moses um, to... Uh, to create the, 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 the tabernacle in the wilderness. And the very first piece of furniture that was to be built was the Ark of the Covenant. I think that's most significant. It was the first thing. It wasn't the, the altar of sacrifice. It wasn't the altar of incense. It was the Ark of the Covenant. And he's told that they are to construct it from acacia wood. And in verse 11 of chapter 25, and you shall overlay it with gold, pure gold, both inside and out. It is the only piece of furniture in the tabernacle that uh, God wanted to be built that had gold on the inside as well as the outside. Now, I think that's most significant. It is perhaps one of the great pictures in the Old Testament of both the humanity and the divinity of the Lord Jesus. It's the only article that is so described. It had to be gold outside and inside, signifying the divine nature as well as the wood, the acacia wood, the human nature of the person of the Lord Jesus. So if that is a right way to view the Ark of the, of the Covenant and see it in the light of the New Testament, it is speaking of Christ. And I emphasize it because you will see that nothing, absolutely nothing in the miracles of the events which are spoken of in chapters three and four of Joshua are possible apart from the Ark of the Covenant. It is absolutely central to everything. There was not a man or a woman or a granddad or a grandma or a grandson or even a great grandson who could go through unless it was because of the work of the Ark of the Covenant. Please, will you just keep that in mind? The Old Testament is signifying that there is to be one and one only work which is sufficient for 
every one of us. No, nothing else will work. And the picture is emphasized in the way that God speaks to Joshua and tells him, you make sure every one of the people of Israel, and they were numbering many hundreds of thousands, not one of you will go through apart from the Ark of the Covenant. And it's of huge significance to note that the Ark of the Covenant is comes to rest right in the midst of the River Jordan. The Jordan at the time of year when they were going through was in flood. There were no crossing places. There was nowhere to, for, to ford. There was absolutely no way to get across except God opens up a way. Now, all of that is immensely significant, at least it is to me. Um, and you will notice the strange, almost strange kind of emphases that uh, God gives to Joshua. You make sure, he says, that there's this distance between them. And yet, in a few verses later, it becomes evident that that distance is completely uh, removed because the ark stands perfectly still at rest in the midst of the river and everybody has to pass the ark nobody got from the wrong side to the right side except they passed where the ark was standing held up by the priests but it was static so everybody had to pass it Nobody can come into the new, into the fullness of the new, into the promised land of Christ, unless they come through him. Now, it's incredibly important. The, the river was in flood. There was no way through. So uh, there's this great distance between them to start with. Um, we read it. 2,000 cubits by measure um <clears throat> 2000 cubits is about 3000 feet which equates to a little over half a mile and they were to keep their focus entirely upon the ark there was no alternative for any one of them all that we should present the Lord Jesus in such a way that men and women come to see there is no alternative but to come through Christ. And they had to, to, to go uh, right through that ark that was standing in the midst of the waters. There was no bypassing him. There was no alternative passageway. None opened up except where the feet of the priests were who were holding the Ark of the Covenant. Christ elevated, Christ uplifted. That should be, I would suggest, the, the ministry that every single one of us has, whether you go to the Arctic or whether you don't, whether you go to the far reaches of, of Africa or India or China or whether you don't. There is no alternative for men and women except that they come to see an exalted Christ. And so uh, God lays down the conditions. The, uh, they are told that when you see the, the ark come to rest, then um, you will know the way. Until then, until that ark enters in, there is no possible way for them to get through. Having gone into the waters and they just were told when your feet touch the edges of the river that's in flood, it will begin to open up to you. And the second thing I want you just please, if you would notice, is this 
that in um, chapter four of, I've lost my piece of paper, I'll come back. In chapter four and verse 11, you read this. It came about when all the people, now please do note, there are no exceptions and everyone entered in and it came about when all the people had finished crossing that the ark of the Lord and the priests crossed before the people. Now, please just note the significance, will you? It was the ark first in, and it was the ark last out. He, the Lord Jesus, is spoken of, and I'm sure you will be well aware of it, particularly in the book of Revelation. He's the first, and he's the last. He's the Alpha and the Omega. He's first in and he's last out. And he guarantees that everybody who will come this way will go in. But only if they will come by the living way that has been opened up. And I use the phrase living way uh, quite uh, decidedly because if you know your book of Hebrews, you will know that um, there has been made for you and I in the 10th chapter of the Hebrew letter. You can read it in verse 20. There is a living way opened up by our Christ. By the Old Testament picture, there was a way physically, geographically made for Israel to cross. I cross out leaving behind the old and into the new. And Jesus Christ stands right there in the midst of that great river of death. For that's what it was. And I'm sure you all will be aware that the geography indicates that the waters that flow uh, uh, through the Jordan end up in the very lowest place on earth, the lowest body of water in the Dead Sea. It's all ever so symbolic, but isn't it a wonderful picture? Don't you think? So here's the ark. In the ark goes. And there he remains until the work is finished. And in a moment or two, we'll pick up on that, the, the finished work. But nobody gets through apart from their contact with the Ark of the Covenant. And what was a distance now becomes very close. They can see it. Of course, you will be aware, I'm sure, that uh, under the Old Covenant, nobody was allowed to look at it. It was hidden away in the Holy of Holies. And when the people of Israel began to move, whether day or night, it was covered over, as were all the articles of the tabernacle. It was never to be seen, but everybody saw it. Everybody passed it. Everybody saw it stationary. And everybody, from young to old, crossed through on that new and that living way. Amen. Wonderful. And here it is written into the history of the people of Israel. It's written there for our learning, for our understanding that we should see what our Christ has really done for every one of us. I come by a new and living way into the presence, into the land, into the newness of a new covenant by the finished work of Jesus Christ. I, I'm aware that you all will, will, you will all confess to that. That's what we believe, brother. Yet we do. But how lovely to see the picture of it in the Old Testament, the gospel contained there. So um, the ark in first and the ark out last. It's as if there he were stationary in the midst of the, the Jordan, gathering everybody unto himself and ushering them through. 
It's just a beautiful picture, a lovely picture. All right. Now then, let's go back to chapter three. <clears throat> um, we've we've read um, verse thirteen. Let's just repeat it, and it shall come about when the soles of the feet of the priests who carry the ark of the Lord, the Lord of all the earth shall rest in the waters of the Jordan, the waters of the Jordan shall be cut off. And the waters which are flowing down from above shall stand in one great heap. In verse 16, same chapter, you will notice this. The waters which were flowing down from above stood and rose up in one heap a great distance away and how remarkable at adam now how, how how amazing is the picture that when christ uh, entered um into death uh he he dealt with adam he dealt with everything that adam could hurl down at him and everything was held back so that the people of israel could cross over uh the waters which were above stood a great distance away at adam the city that is beside zarethan and those which were flowing down toward the Sea of the Araba, the Salt Sea, were completely cut off. So the people crossed opposite Jericho. And all the work of that old Adam was dealt with, cut off, so that I should go through and that you should go through into the land of promise into everything that is ours in Christ. Yes, all of this is contained in the history of Israel, but it is all but picture pointing to what is yours and mine in the new covenant, the new arrangement, the, the work that Christ has finished. So, you read then in verse 17, the last verse of this third chapter, and the priests who carried the Ark of the Covenant of the Lord stood firm. I think that's wonderful. I hope everybody who's listening knows that when Jesus Christ went to the cross, when he entered into the great uh, dealings of with death and sin and all that it had done in the human race, he stood absolutely firm. He didn't budge. And it's, in, it's important to note that when the ark went in and the feet of the priests rested, stopped, they stood firm. The ark of the covenant of the Lord stood firm on dry ground in the middle of the Jordan while all Israel crossed over on dry ground until all the people, the nation, had finished crossing the Jordan. Through they went. Now, uh, just a passing comment, which I'm going to pick up when we come into the New Testament. Would you please note that uh, this, 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 um, the, the passing through is has got nothing to do with getting wet. Everything has to do with dry ground. It's not a picture of water baptism. It's a picture, praise God, of spirit baptism. Whereby I go through and uh, in to the promises of God, into all that Christ has achieved by his death and resurrection. Yet it's, there's, there are pictures, there's another one about to come, which are incredibly, uh, they're vivid and real. And I'm sure written there so that I and you should kind of think to ourselves, is that what it's about? 
this is just wonderful. So there they are. They, they've gone through. Um, nobody got soaked. Nobody got wet. They all went through on dry ground and they came out of the old and into the new. All right. Now then, let's go to chapter four. And I think chapter four is even more exciting and wonderful than chapter three. And I think that's pretty good. Now it came about when all the nation had finished crossing the Jordan that the Lord spoke to Joshua and he said, I want you to take for yourself 12 men, completely unnamed, but they had to be one from each of the tribes. And you are to command them saying, take up for yourselves 12 stones from here out of the middle of the Jordan from the place where the priest's feet are standing firm. Now they had no choice in the matter. They couldn't say, well, I'll pick up this one or that one, or this looks closer to me than the ark. It, it, they had to come from the feet where the, sorry, where the ark was standing near to the feet of the priests. And they were to carry them over with them and lay them down in the lodging place where you will lodge tonight. And that lodging place is a place called Gilgal. And if we have time, we'll notice something about the significance of this word, this place. So will you please now identify these 12 stones as living stones? They've come out of death. And now they're living, they're living stones. Now you don't need me to tell you, at least I hope you don't, that Peter tells us in his epistle that we are living stones. Where, where do we come from? We've come right from the, the very place, the person of the new covenant ark of the covenant from Christ. And the picture is there. There is a death and there is a resurrection. These are living stones. And when the people of Israel had crossed right over, there was not a man or a woman now on the, 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 the side of the promised land who could not look at that, those stones and say, that's me. I identify, that's my tribe. That's the stone that came out of the midst of the Jordan. And it's a stone of life. I'm alive. I, I'm not in. I, 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 I'm, I'm clear. I'm free of it. But what about death dying? There has to be a death before there's a resurrection, doesn't there? Would you agree with that? There has got to be a death before there's a resurrection. So what about the stones of death? Listen to this. Um, they are to put them down. So Joshua in verse four, he called the 12 men whom he had appointed from the sons of Israel, one from each of the tribes. And Joshua said to them, cross again to the ark of the Lord your God, into the middle of the Jordan, and each of you take up a stone on his shoulder according to the number of the tribes of the sons of Israel. Let this be a sign among you, so that when your children ask, what are these stones meant to mean? Then you shall say to them, because the waters of the Jordan were cut off before the ark of the covenant of the Lord, when it crossed the Jordan, the waters of the Jordan were cut off. So these stones shall become a memorial to the sons of Israel forever. They came out of death. They came from right from the feet of the ones who bore this ark of God, this glorious 
a picture of the living Christ. But then God tells um, Joshua to do something quite remarkable. Um, <clears throat> in verse 9 of chapter 4, Joshua did something, and will you please just just note it, nobody had any part in this. Nobody. There were no men to bring the stones to him. They, the, the 12 appointed, took the living stones out of death into life. But there was one and one only who was now going to deal with the stones of death. Joshua set up 12 stones in the middle of the Jordan. Only Joshua. And of course, you will know that Joshua's name is the Old Testament name for Jesus. He's a savior. And he takes these 12 stones, obviously one for each tribe, and he plants them right in the midst of the Jordan. He puts them all together. And they are laid at the feet of the priests who carried the Ark of the Covenant. And they are there to this day. Please note, they are gone. They are dead. They are buried. They are not able to raise their horrible head ever again. They don't come floating to the surface, nor does the Jordan ever expose them. They are there, and they're there to this day. So, let's read on. The priests who carried the ark, who were standing in the middle of the Jordan, until everything was completed. Now, that's in verse 10. Now, you will please, if you will note, it wasn't just the, 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 the people getting through, you know, by the skin of their teeth. It wasn't them rushing over and getting out as quickly as possible. They crossed over, but the work was not complete until there were, until there were the, the burial of the dead and there was the resurrection of the living. They have gone through. Now the stones, these 12 that Joshua put together, they... Uh, the priests were not permitted to leave, to move, until, as we just noted, everything was completed. Now, that's a great statement, don't you think? And then it says that the Lord commanded Joshua to speak to the people according to all that Moses had commanded Joshua, and the people hurried and crossed over. So we've got now a picture, a, a, a remarkable picture, written into the, the pages of the history of this people, indicating death and resurrection. How wonderful. And it came about when all the people had finished crossing that the Ark of the Lord and the priests crossed over before the people. There were living stones and there were dead stones. Joshua alone was told to put these 12 stones together and uh, they were to put them at the feet of the Ark of the Covenant. And until that was done, the work was not complete. May the Lord open all our eyes to see that there's a, a work that has to be completed, that has been completed. Do you, I'm sure you would, all of you, be aware that in John's Gospel, there, there are three references to this finished work. Let me take you there and just point them out. We'll read them and no more than that. To start with, in John's Gospel and in chapter 4, 
Now, chapter four is one of, it certainly is one of my favorites. It's an incredible, it's a wonderful chapter of, of God's dealings with this, this woman from Samaria and how he, appoint, he, he, he made clear he wanted to meet with her, sent all the disciples away and he meets with her. And she, the story is just remarkable. But will you just note this? If you come to uh, verse, um, verse 31, the conversation with the lady has ended and she has gone back to the city. And then the disciples arrive. They have come um, having uh, bought food and um, in the what they arrived back to the well side and in verse 31 they were impressing upon Jesus the need for him to eat but he said I have food to eat that you do not know about I wonder what they thought of that they must have thought what is he talking about The disciples, therefore, they were saying to one another, has somebody brought him something to eat while we've been away? What's he meaning? And Jesus said to them, my food is to do the will of him who sent me and to finish his work. Now, I'm reading from an American Standard Version, and mine says, and to accomplish his work. I think finish his work is a better uh, phrase because it's repeated again in uh, chapter five. If you would just turn there with me. <clears throat> and in chapter five and verse 36, um, <clears throat> Jesus is talking about that which bears witness. Um, he speaks of uh, John the Baptist. Uh, he says of John Baptist, uh, he was a, a burning and a shining light. And you were willing to rejoice for a while in his light. That's verse 35 of chapter 5. But the witness which I have, says Jesus, is greater than that of John for the work which the Father has given me to, to finish or to accomplish. The very works that I do bear witness of me that the Father has sent me. All that he did, the miracles, the might and the power and the wonder of the life of this glorious man, God man of ours, bore witness to who he was and to the man, the person that he was. And then, of course, you've got the final statement, which you will know is spoken from the cross. And it's to be found in chapter 19, when Jesus, um, having said, I am thirsty, uh, a jar full of sour wine was standing there. They put a sponge full of the sour wine upon a branch of hyssop and brought it to his mouth. And Jesus, therefore, having received the wine, he says, it is finished, accomplished. I've done it. There is nothing further to be done. And how wonderful it is to discover that all that Jesus Christ has accomplished is pictured in the history of the people of Israel, I'm taking you in, God says. I didn't bring you out of Egypt that you should wander aimlessly and endlessly. I'm taking you in. And he did. When it was an impossibility, when the river was in flood, there was no way through, and God opens up a new and a living way. And it's related to the Ark of the Covenant, to the person of Jesus Christ. Love the picture, enjoy the picture, but more so love and enjoy the person that the picture is pointing to. 
because the way is now open for you and for me. I hope you are thinking to yourself, this is just remarkable how amazing this book is that these things should have been prefigured in the way that they have been. So um, <clears throat> there's this finished work and we noted back in um, chapter four of Joshua that they, um, in verse 10, that uh, they, everything uh, was completed or finished. The picture is absolutely perfect. The truth of the, the New Testament is concealed there in the Old. But isn't it great to see how the New Testament writers, by the Spirit, came to understand that the Old Testament people of Israel were prefiguring what was going to be accomplished for me and for you. May I just emphasize that this is for you, for me, brother, sister, the work is completed. Now you might say, well, we, we've known that for years and years and years, Di. but tell me, standing on the bank, on the, the right side of the Jordan, not on the wrong side, you, you, can you just imagine somebody from the tribe of, well, let's, the tribe of Manasseh. There they are, they're standing on the, the right side in the land, and this gentleman from the tribe of Manasseh could look at the 12 stones and he would know that one was brought out by our man. And they could stand on that bank and look into the Jordan and say, well, where's our stone? Where's our Manasseh stone? Gone, buried, completely buried and down there and left there and kept there until this day. Christ has done a work that I think I'm only now in my later years beginning to kind of get some great understanding of it. it, it it's baffling to the natural mind. Did you really take me down into death? Did die Patterson? Did Peter Boyle? Did, did you die? Yes, you were taken down into death. And sure, as surely as Christ was raised from the dead, so you and I have been. And of course, if you are thinking of a New Testament passage that we should now go to, I guess you, most of you might say, well, it's Romans chapter six, isn't it? And so it is. We're going to go. Um, hang on a second. I'm going to look at my watch. I think we're not going to go. But we will go the next time I'm with you, if that's okay. Because I think, and I marvel at it, that the finished work of Christ means that there's a death and a life. Yes, you and I, according to Peter, we are living stones, Jesus Christ being the chief cornerstone, but we are living stones. Now, you and I associate stones with something hard and cold and dead. But when you come to the New Testament, you see the picture is completely different from what the natural man understands. These are living stones, the consequence of the work done by Jesus Christ and his death and resurrection. And the only person who can make that death and resurrection real is the Holy Spirit. For Jesus said of him, he shall take of the things which are mine, his death, his resurrection. He shall take of the things which are mine and he will show you. And isn't it wonderful to have a glimpse of something that's recorded in the Old Testament and you can look at it and think, cool, it's pictured there for me. 
What was God thinking, wanting to bury dead stones? What was he thinking, wanting to bring living stones out of the depth, the depths of that death? And let me bring it to a conclusion and just go back to this mention of Gilgal. If you come with me, um, let me see, where is it? Um, where's Gilgal? Don't go away, will you, please? There it is. Chapter four. Now the people came up from the Jordan on the 10th of the first month. Have you ever wondered why it records that? Did you know that it's on the 10th day of the month that everybody in Israel had to take a lamb? And they kept it and it had to be slain on the same day on the day of the Passover, but the lamb was taken on the 10th day. And when they came up from the Jordan, they camped at Gilgal on 12 stones, which they had taken from the Jordan, Joshua set up. Now he didn't say to the young men, no fella, you guy from Ephraim, bring your stone. Manasseh, you bring your stone. Um, Issachar, you bring your stone. He had he, 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 he asked for no help. He needed no help. He set the stones together as he saw fit, and he fitted them together, fitly framed together. Can you see it? It's a picture of Joshua building the church. He fitted them together. He didn't ask help from anybody. And what a wonderful discovery that Jesus Christ is building his church. And he's going to fitly frame you to me and me to you and you to everybody else. Isn't that a wonderful, wonderful picture? So here it is. He, 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 he took them and he set up the 12 stones um, at this place called Gilgal. And he said to the sons of Israel, when your children ask their fathers in time to come, saying, what are these stones? Then you shall inform your children, saying, Israel crossed this Jordan on dry ground. For the Lord your God dried up the waters of the Jordan before you until you had crossed just as the Lord your God had done at the Red Sea, which he dried up before us until we had crossed. The word Gilgal means this. It means a rolling away. And God spoke to, um, to Joshua and said, this day, all that's attached to Egypt, all the failure all the captivity, all the bondage, all the heartache, all the heartbreak, it's all going to be rolled away today. And it's done by the building of men and women together so that, brother, you are to be a comfort to everybody else. You're not here for yourself. Sister, you are to be a means of ministering comfort and grace and to be a minister to everybody else within that body. This is not something just for the, the, the select few. This was everybody in all the tribes put together, fitly framed together, so that they might be a testimony and that they may be a means of bringing comfort and grace and ministry one to the other. And the only person who can build such a building is the person of Jesus Christ. He was the only one who could go into the death of the Jordan and bring out the living and leave behind all the failure and the ignominy and the shame and the disgrace and say, you're free. You're in the land. Now go in and possess and dwell in it and live in the wonder of it. It's all yours. 
Amen. If you, if you, my brother or sister, if you have got issues in your heart and you're constantly going back to the old and you're, you find that things in the past, they dog you. And there's the whisper of the enemy to say, well, you know, you'll never be free of this. You take a look at the picture. There it is. We're free. How wonderful is that? And God grant that we should be fitly framed together. And of course, you, you, you may need to have some corners knocked off you so that you don't dig your elbows into somebody else nearby. But we were fused into a glorious church. He's coming back for his church, you know. He is. I'm told he's coming back soon. I, I, I'm not sure whether that's true or not. You may have to enlighten me, but he's coming back and he's going to come back for a glorious church. He's going to come back for a company of living men and women who can look back to that place of death and say, I died. I died. And I'm alive. Well, you know, don't you, that Paul said, I am crucified with Christ. I've, I've died. Nevertheless, I live. Yet not I, but Christ lives in me. Amen. Can we delay Romans chapter 6 until another occasion? Let's pray. Shall we? Hallelujah. Lord, oh, I pray. I want to ask for myself and I want to ask for my brothers and sisters. Would you please, Lord, open up my understanding and their understanding to see the glory and the wonder and the greatness of what you really have done. Father, Thank you for writing it into the history of that Old Testament people. And thank you, Lord, for opening the understandings of your New Testament people, that we may see the picture, but we can't live in pictures. We have to live in the reality of what you've accomplished. I want to see. I want to see it newly, freshly, daily, ever increasing in understanding of that finished work. To see all my sin, all that was mine because of Adam, it's all been cut off. And Christ has triumphed. And the work is finished. And unto your name, Lord, and only unto your name, be the glory and the honor and the praise. Amen.